Hi everyone, welcome to Metal Click, our Connect, where we get to hang out with one of the speakers from Saturday and dive into what they're working on, what they're doing, and learn from their knowledge. This week is uh, all around the black sheep. We're gonna dive mm -hmm. into whole, this whole idea of why being the black sheep is a good place to be. Brent Mansworth is joining us. Brent, where are you located, by the way? I am in Cocoa, Florida. So tell us about Cocoa, Florida. What does Cocoa, Florida add to your life to make you a great speaker and give you all that creative wisdom? Oh, wow. Uh, that's that's asking a lot of Cocoa, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so Co Cocoa, I'm inland from Cocoa Beach, which is probably most famous for Ron John Surf Shop, right? Where it's one of the most famous surf shops in the in the country. Uh, I'm sorry, wait, wait, Brent, please be honest. It's I, a genie. Yeah, yeah, it's true. That's it's true. true. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Just want to let everyone know. That's right. And then a little further north is is Cape Canaveral. So every rocket launch is like literally seven miles out my backyard. So I go outside and it shakes the house. And that's that's sort of uh, every time Elon Musk is in town, that that's what happens. Have you seen a few launches? <laughs> oh, I've seen, you know, at this point, dozens and dozens. Oh. Yeah. I've actually been on the roof of the shuttle uh, vehicle assembly building. Wow which is the highest building in the state of Florida. Yeah, yeah, I believe there's an atmosphere inside there. It's so yeah. high. There's clouds it, on the top of it, right? It, it, it actually rains inside the building. That's yeah, mind-blowing. That's so damn it cool. Is. Wow. It, it's crazy. And are you there by choice or are you there because of family? Uh, family. So my wife's family is from this area. It's from Rockledge, which is just next to Coco. Mm -hmm. And when I was touring uh, with the band for 20 years, she wanted to be close to her folks. And so that's... That's what brought us here. I'm, I'm originally, I'm from Manchester, New Hampshire. So this is not wow. my preferred climate, but yeah, it's not it is. Material. That's right. It's not. But, okay, so let, let's go through this. Rock and roller guy, mm -hmm. touring all over the place. Mm -hmm. Was it the sex drums and rock and roll type thing? Uh, you know, it, it, we never quite made it at that level. We were famous enough to do it for 20 years uh as a living but not famous enough to be d fucking snyder <laughs> so there is a there's a difference between uh, that but you know we we did uh two different bands two different record deals uh some of the same members in both bands and uh you know, we, we toured all over all over the world for 20 plus years, sort of that Americana blues rock thing. Uh, we were sort of, we did the Mumford thing before Mumford hit it. And, uh, and then we sort of morphed into a alt rock, uh, Southern rock band. You, you did Christian rock too, right? I did early on. Yeah, very, very beginning of my career, like 2003. Uh, yeah, we did that. We toured with some of the, the big Christian bands, the you know, Third Days and the Jars of Clays and the Toby Max and all of those bands back in the day. Yeah. You know, but let's admit it. You did on Modern Metal. You opened for Dean Snyder. <laughs> that's the truth. You, you better did. believe. I mean, you better believe that's what's on my resume now. <laughs> <laughs> Open for Dean Snyder. Well, that's, that's how we. That's how we do it in the music business. We play in the parking lot. That's effectively opening for whoever's playing in the stadium. It works, but you know, really, you got to understand being in front of a crowd, understanding an audience, owning that stage. So yep. to go into public speaking seems like a direct parallel. It just totally works, doesn't it? It does. You know, I did, so sort of between the band and the public speaking, uh, I pastored a church for six years, which is like, the for me, is the best preparation for uh, what public speaking is. And so that to me was a, a really great training ground for allowing enough space to, to capture the truth in the room while you're speaking. And uh, you know, there's a big difference to me between speakers and presenters. There's, there's a whole bunch of presenters in the country, but they're very few speakers. Well, and so- about, Tell us about the difference. Well, presenters present information and speakers leave enough in the room to capture lightning in a bottle. And so you got to let the room sort of decide where it's going to go and be able to have the wit and the wherewithal to, to capture that in a moment and use it to make what you do better. And that is, uh, there's very few, I mean, I can name them on one hand. <laughs> there's very few people who, who I feel um, have that ability. You know, there's a lot of people who are really good at just presenting information. And if the information is, is uh, uh, 
alluring in any way, shape or form, then that's great. But sometimes it, you know, it's just information. And so the ones who do it well, get paid really well to do it. You know, I, I'm, I, I grew up, I went to seminary. Yep. So I was going to be a Jesuit priest at one point in time. Yep. One thing that they wanted us to understand is you have to be in the infotainment space to really own the, the, I don't, what do we call it? I forget what we even call it, Adam. Uh, the altar. You have to yeah. do, you have to infotain to own the yeah. altar to get enough money to pay for the church. Yep. And most priests sucked. They were horrible. Mm -hmm. So when I went in the 80s, they made, made us go through speaker classes, presentation classes, and do mm -hmm. things like that. And I'm wondering if you were doing the same thing as a preacher, man, you had to learn to own that stage. And that's tough. It is, it, you know, it's interesting to me as I sort of transitioned from the pulpit to the, to the platform, just to do these conferences is that, you know, the conference circuit is sort of like the comedy world, right? Like you sort of have your routine, you do your routine and you get in and you get out and you go on to the next club. Uh, and that is very prevalent there, but, but, um, to be able to bring something a little bit different to every talk so that they're not all exactly the same is, is rare. Um, but it's what makes people want to come and see you every time you speak, as opposed to going, Oh, I've, I've seen that routine. I, I don't need to see that one again. That's important by the way, because every talk I do, I'm, I'm like Allison, I would do two to three talks a week mm -hmm. and not one talk was ever the same. The reason why is because most of these places record the talk and they put it on YouTube. That's right. And all of a sudden, YouTube becomes your enemy where you thought it'd be your tool to promote you more. So it's yeah. a problem. So you have to come up with original content almost every time you're on stage. Yeah. I, so I follow something called the Red Thread, um, which uh, it was developed by a woman named Tamsin Webster. And it's basically just a way to craft a narrative. And so there's five parts of the Red Thread that she teaches. So it's, it starts with uh, the goal, and then you move to the challenge then you tell them the truth, then you ask them to change, and then you tell them what you want them to do. And so, you know, every talk I give is centered around those five pillars, but the, the words that I'm going to say are never written down. I get it. I'm getting, I'm getting crap from Ethan that he can't hear me properly. All right, mm -hmm. Z, I will fix that, Z. I will put my <laughs> microphone on. Uh, the women on, at metal are, they can I'm just saying his is phenomenally clear. Like <laughs> just saying. <laughs> you got me now, Ethan. Z, do I sound a little better? Perfect. <laughs> no? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, I gotta do my settings here. Sorry about this. Hang on, guys. I'm not even the guy you want to hear. Yeah, you should be able to hear me much, much better. Uh speaker. You should be able to hear me much better now. Come on. I hear you, man. I hear it's you. It's better, right? Yeah. All right. I like how you said that. You said Brant's mic sounds so clear, meaning mine doesn't. I get it. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, there we go. So, hey, I, I understand the whole idea. What you're doing is you're, you're creating a story arc. So That's when you're right. on stage, you have a story arc. What Pixar has done for the longest time, they've owned us in every story arc. Yeah. But if you're talking in different industries, by the way, the reason why I'm bringing this up is to be a speaker, guys, if you ever want to go on this path, you speak at everything from the Veterinary Association of America to the Motor Truck Association of Ohio. You never know because they're going to pay you five to $20,000. It doesn't matter. So all of a sudden your story has to work with them. And that brand, how do you do that? How do you make your story work for all of these different groups? Well, your content is, is everything, right? And so for me, because I speak on core values and purpose, it doesn't, it's not industry specific in that, uh, that was purposeful, right? So that it, yeah. that it translates into every industry. So like in the last three or four weeks, you know, I've done everything. I, I spoke for uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, Anthem Health uh, this last week. Before that, it was uh, uh, the uh, American Animal Laboratory, no, the, the American, wait a minute, the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science. Um, you know, before that, it was the uh, uh, leader, uh, what is it? Life Science Trainers uh, and Educators Network. So, I mean, it's like literally every every week, it's it's somebody different in a different 
uh, in a different area of, of industry. And, but the message is, is always the same. The message is about discovering what matters most, what are your non-negotiables, and how do you use those to be a better leader? And so that, uh, that translates no matter where it's at. And so what I've been doing uh, since the, you know, the, I have this new book that comes out September 29th. And um, when I sort of went to promote the book, I knew that I was going to be doing this. So I created an online assessment that helps people get to what I call your flock of five black sheep values. And so it starts with about 125 commonly held personal core values, and it helps you sort of get down to what your flock of five would be. These are the ones that you can't live without. And so what I do is every uh, company that hires me to come in and speak, I have the organization take the assessment. And what that allows me to do is build a values map of the organization. So I can sit there and say, okay, I know these are your, your five or six organizational core values, but do you know what matters most to your people? That's and awesome. I'm able to show them by gender and by 10 year age gap from 20 and under to 60 and over, um, what each one of those flock of fives actually are. And it's fascinating wow. to see, you know, and one, I, the one I just did, uh, something like wisdom shows up in women from 30 to 40, but it doesn't show up in men till they're over 50. And so when you start to see things like that, uh, it really helps with engaging your people and even straight out to your marketing of how you're trying to present your product or service. Yeah, but now it becomes customized for the client. Apps, everyone, everyone, yeah, that's powerful. That really which is. lets me keep my fee integrity too, right? Because they'd be paying a hundred grand to get Gallup to come in and do something like that. So they don't balk at all when I come in with my, you know, with my speaking fees, it's, it's a fraction of the cost of what it would be for them to gather that information through one of these larger, you know, uh, polling type of services. Yeah, it's a challenge right now maintaining your speaking fees in the environment we're on and being virtual on top of it, right? Well, it's, it's all about production. So it's why I invested so heavily into this studio because I knew that I was going to be going up against talking heads over a, a PowerPoint presentation. And if I could produce something better than that, then why would they want to have anybody else but me? And so that was sort of the, the approach. And so being able to have, you know, the switching of the cameras to be able to draw here on my yeah, pad. Yeah, we love this. Right? To be able to go to animation where I can go like this and all of a sudden I've made myself this <laughs> completely animated deal where I have that to be able to come back and do whatever, you know, the, the idea of using those using bumpers using videos using overlays like like i used uh during the last time i talked very of, customizable right all of those things um it's more like a late night television show as opposed to uh you know any sort of a powerpoint presentation and so because of that they're willing to they're willing to pay the the higher fees i got one for you to check out especially doing core values have you checked out crystal nose Hmm, I'm writing it down. I'm going to show you this. Look at, look at what this does. Let me go see if I could find my uh, Chrome. So look at this. So what I did is I did a quick check on you. Yep. Look at what it tells me about you. It says to me that you are, you are, this is you. Tell me if that's accurate. Okay. Let me, let me try to make this. You're confident, uh, persuasive, spontaneous, accurate, uh, right? Yes. yes. And then it shows you and I, so I'm, I'm more risk tolerant, you're more risk averse, but you can see you and I are very similar actually as individuals. Yeah. yeah. And then as we, you're what's called a driver. Yep. And then it tells me what comes naturally to you. Yep. The reason why I'm bringing all this up is I love when I'm speaking and I'll, I'm gonna send this to you so you can actually see it. So what yeah. I do is I, I go to the event coordinator and I do it on them and I show it on stage. Oh, I love that. So all of a sudden it's like they are, you know, they're, they're, they're naked now in front of everybody. And everyone goes, oh, that's exactly how they are. They are. And they are always amazed going, hey, can you, can you do this for such and such? Yeah. And it becomes even more customizable. And that is yeah. what are the individuals that you're dealing with? Who are they? And now yeah. they build another relationship with you because now they want you to come back next year because uh, you're yeah. always doing it differently. So love I love this black sheep thing you threw out was really insightful because we always look Great. at the black sheep as being the negative. You mm -hmm. found a way to make it the positive and actually a marker on where things are. Yeah. That was really brilliant. So well, thank you. People that missed out on that. Can you reiterate sure. that again? Sure. 
So I was 47 years old when I finally found out why farmers don't value black sheep like the rest of the flock. Uh, and it's because a black sheep's wool cannot be dyed. And so it doesn't have the same value as the ones that can be made into, you know, 500 different things. And so uh, when I found that out, it basically told me that every black sheep is 100% authentically original. And that to me is my life's goal is to be who I was, you know, uniquely created to be. And so for me, I'm like, why, we've demonized this for hundreds of years when in fact it should be what we aspire to be. And so, you know, I believe that we all have this flock of five black sheep values, these personal deeply held core values that no matter how much someone wants to try to influence or persuade you, they simply won't be changed like a black sheep's wool. And so the book helps you discover what that flock of five are, helps you prove that they are indeed real because I can tell you um, from the thousands of people that I, that I have coached through this over the last two years, uh, I have never experienced someone whose initial flock of five was what it finished at the end of five weeks when we do this program. Um, they've never stayed the same. And that's because two or three of them are, are absolutely without question um, your black sheep values, but two or three of them are what I call aspirational sheep. They're, they're who you want to be, but they're not who you are. And uh, when you go to track them, when you go to have to find proof that these actually exist, exist in your life and you can't find any proof, then you start to realize which ones are real and which ones aren't. And, and when that happens, it really helps you focus in on those other two or three that were a little bit shaky in the beginning that you were able to sort of dial them in. And when you do that, that's when you can actually choose when and where they appear in your life. You speak them into existence, into your calendar on a daily basis, writing them into the different appointments that you have for which ones you wanna show up and you stop waiting for the perfect opportunity for to arise to have these things manifest themselves. You choose where and when they do. And the minute I started doing that, my whole, my whole life changed wow. completely. That's powerful. Mm. Okay, so let's, can we talk about those? Yeah, yeah. You gotta show off now, right? Yeah. So my, my flock is actually, uh, I have six, right? So, so uh, creativity, hope, impact, empathy, family, authenticity. These are my uh, unchangeable, undiable personal core values. Every decision I make gets filtered through these six things. Uh, in the book, I, I discuss what is a good decision? How do we make good decisions? And one of the interesting things that, that, uh, over the last couple of years of asking people from the stage, how do you know when you've made a good decision? 95% of the time, the answer that I get is some form of outcome or result. And, and uh, it doesn't work that way. The science doesn't support that. So that's something called outcome bias, where you use an outcome to justify whether a decision was good or bad. Uh, so the book talks about a good decision is one that is born from these black sheep values it considers all of the facts that you can get your hands on and it honors what you're feeling in the moment. If you can do those three things, then you've made a good decision regardless of a result or outcome. And when you finally understand that outcomes are out of our control, we are not wizards, we are not, uh, we don't possess that kind of power. Um, and you start to focus on honoring these things instead, well, then you actually remove happiness from an outcome and put it into your control. And so you live a much happier life, a much more fulfilled life because you are in control of what you choose to honor and what you don't. And how did you come up with those six? So for me, it was uh, going back over, gosh, 40 years of the things that matter most. So, so there's two ways that I like to, to sort of get the ball rolling, right? One of them is to look uh, uh, at our favorites. And so our favorites say a lot about what matters most to us. Most of the time we have a favorite because it connects our head and our heart, which engages the limbic brain, which is where all of this emotional long-term memory is stored. It's why you remember song lyrics. It's why you remember quotes from movies and all those sorts of things. And so when we start to look at our favorite movies, our favorite songs, our favorite food, our favorite smells, they're all breadcrumbs back to these, these things that matter most to us, these deeply held personal core values. And so when you start to do that work, you start to understand that there's some common thread that goes through these things. And so so for me, that's, that's what it came down to. I, but help us out to identify a favorite. What is a favorite? So like if I said to you, give me one of your top 
three favorite movies of all time? Godfather. Like what, Godfather? Yeah, Godfather, Matrix. Okay. So you want one more, right? That doesn't matter. It can be, I can use either, any of those, right? Okay. So let, let's talk about The Godfather for a second. Godfather. Um, so tell me, for anyone who hasn't seen The Godfather, can you give us a 60 second summary? What's The Godfather about? Guy takes a red pill and automatically is teleported. No. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's about a, a family that has power. Uh, that uh, knows they're persecuted from the the rest of America. They're from Italy, and they find a way to utilize their family power to control the alcohol trade, and then eventually the narcotics trade, and and even prostitution trade, and how the families would fight with one another to destroy or take each other's businesses. Okay, is there a particular character in that movie that really resonates with you? Uh, Don Colion. Why? Power, okay. family, yep. connection. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So, um, you know, here's, the, here's what I would say is that the reason that I always ask people to describe it is it's because the words that you choose, again, leave breadcrumbs back to these things that matter most to you. So based on what you just described, I would say that in the words that you would select that are things that are incredibly important to you. Now, I don't know yet. No, that's okay. You're going to say power, family. Sheep, right? I got it. Yeah. So you got uh, authority, perseverance, impact, power, connection, family, all of those different things uh, are, are words that resonate. So we start to look at those. And as you know, if I was coaching you, I would, I would look at the cliff notes version of your life. And I would tell, you know, I'd ask you for, tell me, you know, what did your parents do? What did you grow up? You know, where did you go to high school? Did you play sports? What were your hobbies? And you start to see these recurring themes over and over and over You would again. use a movie as a, a base point. Yes. Got it. So most guys would say Shawshank Redemption is what you said in the past. That is the number one um, favorite movie of all the people that I've asked in the last two years. The I'm number- shocked that anybody could remember the characters' names. Yeah, I know. Yes, it's true. It's true, right? It's true. And uh, the second favorite has been Princess Bride. Those were the top right. two. The top two movies, right? But what's interesting again is it doesn't really matter what the movie is. It what matters is how they choose to describe it. Yeah, it's and a so point. and that's it. And so that's sort of when I'm on stage and we are doing this in a crowd of two, three thousand people. You know, this is what happens, and 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 people start to describe it. And uh, it's always a fun time, but at the same time, it really starts to shine a light on some of these things that are potentially black sheep values for them. Mm, got it. Again, black sheep is not a negative, guys. It's positive. Yeah. And being the positive, which I think is brilliant because no one has ever made it a positive, ever. Right. Black sheep is the biggest negative of anything. You're the black sheep of the family. Hey, by the way, real quick, uh, Jared yeah. wants you, can you please repeat the three thread points again. Absolutely. Uh, So it starts with the goal. You have to tell people what the goal is. Then you have to explain the challenge that you're facing. Then you have to get them to agree to the truth, whatever that truth is going to be that you present. Then you have to ask them to change. And then you have to tell them the action that you want them to take in order to do that. Goal, challenge, truth, action, a change action. Change action. There you go. Yep. And that is Tamsin Webster. You can look her up. Uh, she's got a ton of videos on YouTube explaining the red thread, uh, breaking down famous brands, showing you sort of how they use it, how they, how they use it to communicate what's important to them, all those sorts of things. So she's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So let's go back to core values. Mm-hmm. Apply that now to a culture in a company Mm-hmm. or culture in some type of entity? How do you, can you bring those back now to yeah. fortify or enhance what you currently have? So uh, there's a couple of things. So first I find that for a lot of organizations, their organizational values are, are nothing but lipstick. They're not real. And uh, I know they're not real because there's no evidence of, of them outside of what's on their core values page of their website. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to tell them that I look at, you know, your core values are basically like your organization's hit songs. That's what you want them to remember, right? (laughs) They're they're their hit songs. So we have to look at what makes a song a hit. And there's really only two things that need to happen to make a song a hit. So first, the songwriter has to do their job. It has to connect the head and the heart. If the song connects the head and the heart, then you're halfway there. After that, 
well, then the radio stations have to actually play the song enough for everybody to sort of hear it. So a, a, a true hit song in this country in this day and age is played about 10,000 times a week at least. And, you know, that breaks down to roughly hearing it once every three to four hours in every market in the U.S. So what I ask companies that I work with is if I were to look, are your organizational core values experienced, felt, witnessed, seen once every three to four hours a day at work? If the answer is no, it's never going to be a hit. No one's ever going to remember it. So we have to make sure that they have a deliberate plan for these things to be experienced, number one, if they are true. Um, and once that we have figured out what that's going to be, by everybody discovering what their black sheep values are, we're able to build a bridge to what matters most to the organization. So if the organization tells me that transparency is one of their core values, and I look at mine and I say, okay, how can I creatively approach transparency to impact my team? How can I use transparency to drive hope for my clients? How can I... Um, be authentic with this transparency so that I can empathize with the people on the team that might not like what they're about to hear. So you see, I'm actually using my, th the things that matter most to me to drive the organizational value home. And that's what makes it feel right. That's what makes it actually connect with your employees. And so that's what, that's the work I do when I go into organizations is I help them build bridges from the individual to the organizational value. Hey guys, you got a question, comment, anything you want, please put it in the chat, unmute you, and then we'll dive into it. This is an open forum, so ask any question you want. You know, besides being a great inspirational speaker on stage, he also is, you know, helping cultures and businesses, plus former rock star, and he's got one of the best, come on, the best interactive setup you could possibly have. It's, it, <laughs> You know, in, in my day, we're around the same age. We would say it's tits, man. That's tits. Yeah, that's right. That just says our that's age right. right there, right? That's right. The bee's knees, baby. Yeah, yeah the bee's knees. That's right. So, and the setup, by the way, is what? Do you just want to tell us again what you have? Sure. So I've got um, basically three cameras going right now. So this first, this, this main one is a Sony A5100, which is a budget-friendly DSLR. Camera. And do you have that going through a teleprompter to where you're seeing the screen at the same time, or are you just looking at the camera? So I'm looking at the camera, but behind the camera, I have a 42 inch television mounted on the wall. Yep. Got it. Okay. So everybody is sort of, the, the, the camera is in the center of the grid where everybody is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first camera. This, the second camera, this overhead right here is mm -hmm. a, a Logitech C920 ah. webcam, right? Okay. And then this camera is actually just my iPhone. Is all oh, I really? Uh-huh. So all I've done here is it's just hacked the iPhone to do SMS messaging, but I've cropped the screen so you can't see the whole screen. So I'm really sort of, I can change this to be whatever I want it to be, being a, you know one of their other Animojis that, that they offer. But so all you're seeing is a live version of the screen uh, on this particular thing. So I use that as a third camera. And are you are using, um, e, was it EPCOP or, e, or EPOC cam? Is that what you're using on the iPhone? No, nope. it's what literally, you... it's literally just plugged direct in, uh, into, so the software that I use to do everything is called eCam. Right, eCam, but there has to be an interface to the phone. No, not with e really? No, not with eCam, no. Cause I got eCam also, but that, that was yeah. the interface I had to have. Interesting, oh, that's yeah. awesome. So, so you can show because, you know, if you don't want it to show all the rest of what's on your phone, then you just have to crop the screen to take away some of that stuff. And the mic if you're using? Is a Logitech, oh, I'm sorry, this is a Blue Yeti right here. Is it a USB mic? It's a USB mic. That's all it is. It's a large diaphragm USB mic. It's about 100, 100 bucks, 119 bucks maybe. And are you going into a compressor? Nope. That's, I'm going direct to the computer. Really? Yep. Wow. Yep. So that's still a good, what, twelve dollars to $15,000 setup, right? This whole thing cost me less than 2500 bucks. Wow. And that includes never... this. That includes the ability to control and do movement. So this is a, a GVM motorized slider that I control the speed, the throw, the whole bit, right? So I can actually have it sort of spin around me as I'm doing things. So it just keeps it interesting, keeps people focused on what I want them to. Um, and then and I've the, got a ring, a ring light. Fake, 
the fake background's great too. That fake digital background. Yeah, you like that? That's nice. <laughs> it took me a minute. It took me a minute. What's crazy is I'm in a ten by ten room. It looks huge, but it really is, does. This is a ten by ten room, so I'm a, I'm against a wall. So I've got about seven, six or seven feet behind me, right? And so that's what gives it a little bit more of that depth of field that makes it feel bigger than it is. Oh, it's good lighting. It's kick ass lighting. Yeah. It really is. Those are literal twenty dollar Walmart LEDs on the floor that I've got gels coloring them that, that, you know, were a, a Michael's craft store purchase. And uh, literally, I, I think I have in, that $2,500 includes my, my Mac mini. It includes the computer. Damn, is that a damn good price. And then right now, uh, sound wise, you seem to have really good acoustics in there. Yeah, well, that's just so, you know, it's wood, it's wood floors here, but I've got carpet there. Yeah. Um, and I've put up this wood sort of behind me on the wall to try to uh, just in the corners and stuff to just try to keep some of the stuff from bouncing too hard. It's, it um, sounds great. So let's talk about some of these virtual speaking events. Is almost sure. everything you're uh, getting asked for in Zoom or are they asking for some other platforms too? No, there's, there's a huge variety of platforms. So um, it could be WebEx. It could be WebEx has been a big one recently. WebEx is a pain in the ass because uh, virtual cameras aren't they don't play nice with virtual what happens in that that situation you have this incredible setup what do you do with a webex environment so there's a couple ways to hack it um i can create a custom stream key to where they're going to which is what i just did for one of the ones that i had so i created a custom stream key that that allowed me to stream in as opposed to sort of logging in like this yeah uh so that was able to get around that but you know i've done webinar jam i've done blue jeans i've done um you know literally probably a dozen different platforms uh you know uh, ms teams is is gaining a lot of ground on zoom in the last month or two which one do you like the most so so it depends on on what the if you want to do breakouts zoom is just the best yeah. It's just, it's the easiest to do. And, and sort of uh, the, when you go to the next level with Zoom, you've got the registration pages and all that other stuff that sort of comes along with it. Mm -hmm. um, from, from some of the other standpoints, Webinar Jam is really a powerful uh, a platform as well. I really enjoy using that too. Is that web-based? It is, yep. Okay. Yep. And you've got like On24, which is a, a little higher end, a little more expensive. Um, and then you, you go to the next level up, which is like Feed Loop. Um, P-H-E-E-D loop, which is more event-based. So if you're doing thousands of people, something like feed loop would be uh, your front end and they can use something like Zoom on the back end uh, to sort of get your presenters and stuff into the room. Interesting. And, and you're, you're finding that they have good load balancing because that was one of our biggest problems was we're seeing people coming from different parts of the world. It was mm -hmm. really bad at, if they weren't load balanced properly in that part of the world. Yeah. I mean, you're going to struggle, I think, no matter what with, with yeah. some of those things. Uh, what people don't realize when it comes to virtual is that it's, it's all about your upload speed, not your download speed. And so most people's upload speed sucks. And yeah. so they don't think about it. If they've got fiber or, or you know, some sort of optic uh, solution, then they've got fantastic. It's, it's equal, right? So they've got whatever, 500 up, 500 down, or a thousand up, thousand down. Yeah. Um, but like I have for this, I've got 400 down and like 25 up is the highest. Six, six to be okay. 12 is really comfortable. That's, that's the up you need. Yeah. But six yeah. is, especially with that camera you have, because you're hitting HD, you yeah. need at least six. Yeah. So I've got this camera. Um, this camera is going through a, uh, a black magic ultra studio mini recorder which is just basically a digital converter uh, which allows me to use it as a webcam and so that uh you're right so for me if i go below 20 on my up i get a little bit of lag and oh, so I'll, I'll i'll have some uh, of uh the syncing goes away between audio and video mike brown wants to know have you tried uh, is that stream deck yep Yep, absolutely. So Stream Deck and Ecamm are sort of uh, two different versions of the same idea of what you can do. Um, Stream Deck for me uh, is a little uh, a little clunkier than Ecamm is. Um, Ecamm's uh, interface is really, really easy to use and extremely powerful. Uh, Stream Stream Deck, well, so Stream Yard. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Stream Yard. Stream Deck is simply uh, this. 
So I use Stream Deck, which is this, right? Oh, wow. It's just, it's all buttons. So that's it. And so one of these just went off uh, right there. So the entire presentation that I do, I load up onto this. And so I don't ever look at anything. I just push buttons. So it's all chronological from left to right and then up to down, right? So I've got, and what you're seeing, if you can actually see it, it's a preview of what's actually going to be on the screen. Nice. So when you see all of these slides are the ones that I'm pulling up. If you see something like a speaker, that is a, either a sound effect or a music. So like when I'm doing a full talk, I'll soundtrack the talk. So I'll be talking and, and you know, bringing something like this in the background to sort of get the energy going, depending upon what I'm talking about in that moment. Um, and, and if I wanted to do something a little slower, you know, I bring in this sort of very soft piano music sort of happening in the background to, to sort of slow things down a little bit. So my whole bottom row of my stream deck is nothing but music that I, that I am picking on the fly to sort of support what it is that I'm going to be saying uh, when I'm doing my talks. I'm looking and, at that to be about 150 bucks. Is that accurate? That's, that's the basic version. The XL, which has more buttons, is $249. You can get it at Best Buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking at Amazon. Wow, that's a great call. Thank you oh, very gosh. much. It's so like, it, it allows you to do so much more without worrying about using your mouse to point and click and try to find something. It's so pretty let, let, let's do a segue here. Segue is this. We got a bunch of guys in the group that are going to mm -hmm. watch this later on that want to become speakers, not presenters. Sure. Speakers. Yeah. What advice can you give them that you've learned? And when did you make the crossover, if you ever did, from a presenter to a speaker? So number one, you have to own your, your content. Like you have to know it better than anybody else. Even if you weren't the creator of your content, you have to know it better than anybody else. You have to be able to defend it. In, to anyone, whether it's a Harvard grad who's char you know, challenging you on the science behind what it is you're talking about, you have to, when you own it at that level, then you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You can just focus on the delivery. And that's really what I would highly recommend is that, you know, this is a little bit different. Presenting virtually is a lot more difficult because you're your own producer. You're your own lighting guy. You're your own AV guy. You're your own, you know, you have to do all this stuff and it's not normal. <laughs> Normally there's, yeah. there's a whole team of people that are doing it for you. So, yep. so that is a little bit different, but if you're going to get out there on stage, um, you got to have a little bit of swagger and, and it can be quiet swagger. It can be loud swagger, but you've got to have a little bit of swagger because you're the expert. And the minute you do anything that, that makes people perceive you not as an expert, you're done. So you've got to get onto that stage. You can be vulnerable. You can tell stories. You can show them your heart, but you are the expert and they have paid a shite ton of money for you to come and tell everybody what it is that you know. So you need to present it in that way. And they'll be thankful that you do present it that way. Um, and that, that to me is everything. So it starts by owning, just like, you know, in the music business, if you don't know the song, if you're looking at your hands, if you're looking at the lyrics, it, it, <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't perform in a way that's going to grab people. Um, but if you own it enough that you don't have to do any of that, it's just second nature for you, then you can really focus on connecting. And that is what's going to get people to, to have that experience that makes them want to come back, that makes them want to tell everybody how great you were when you spoke. And, and that's what leads to referral business, which is probably the number one way in the speaking world to, to get additional business is just go kill it. And every time you kill it, it should lead to three or four more gigs. It surprises me that a mutual friend of ours, Alison Levine, mm. her talk is almost the same everywhere she goes. It is. It's yeah. the same story, but she is booked for $32,000 on an average three uh -huh. times a week, yep. all the time. Yep. Why does that work? Is it because it's her? Yeah. So it's a couple of things and she'll tell you, she's, she'll flat out tell you, number one, she's a woman, which in this market matters. Um, you know, diversity uh, starts with gender, I think, and then moves towards 
race and and then moves towards the LGBTQ community and then moves towards diversity of thought. Um, and so there's a there's a pretty wide definition of diversity in the speaking world. Um, but because she is just she's a badass. Uh, I mean, she literally has has climbed the seven highest peaks and she's freaking, you know, tra traversed the South Pole and the North Pole and the, yeah. you know, like she's done so many things that um, her her basic talk that she's been giving for ten years um, still resonates when it comes to you know th this is the interesting thing I think people don't know what it takes to climb Mount Everest they think they know but they don't know the actual process of having to go to you know, camp one and then come down and then having to go to camp one again and come back down and then go camp one, camp two, and then go to camp one, then come all the way back down. And so you know, this idea of planning these retreats, sort of moving backwards into the actual plan to reach the summit is such a, a, a profound idea when it comes to business because people think that taking a step back means you're, you're not doing well. But what if, what if the plan actually required you to take a step back? And I think that that message resonates on a leadership level from what she talks about. And she's such an incredibly powerful speaker. Um, she has swagger for days and that, and that really connects with an audience. You know, the, here's the thing. The bigger the crowd, the bigger the stage, the bigger the swagger has to be. And so there's a lot of people that are great in a room of 50 or great in a room of 100, but you put them in a room of 2000 and they, they're, they get swallowed by the space. And so that's, that's tough, right? It's a tough thing to do in the, in the, the sort of more successful you become, it, it, you have to get that level of being able to, to be on a stage of that size and have people still engaged with you and not looking around or looking at their watches as to when you're going to finish your talk. So true. The bigger the audience, you're probably like me, you feel stronger. Oh, it's yeah. like you absorb, absorb that power. It is. So, you know, I have found on the big stage, it's your job to inspire, right? That's what you do. You want people walking out of there like they saw Rocky for the first time. Virtually, that's not what you want. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't connect, right? Yeah, so what, what do you do online? What's the difference? Virtual is all about intimacy and behavior change. That's it. So like, it's literally getting super close to the camera and having this one-on-one -on -one connection with whoever it is that's watching. And even though there might be 6,000 people on this call watching it, they feel like you're talking directly to them. Yeah. And that allows for a much deeper dive in whatever it is you're talking about and, and for them to actually believe in this behavior change that you're asking them to make. Um, which has been a profound learn for me over the last two or three months. So like when we get out of this, when I go back to the big stages, this, what we're doing right here still becomes a secondary offering, right? So it's like, I'll go and do the big talk for X, but then why don't we book two follow-ups over the course of six months? And, you know, we drive home the stuff that they were inspired by on the big stage with this deliberate uh, behavior change asks in the virtual world. And then you sort of have the best of both worlds. I'm doing my first speaking gig in person on September 24th in Nashville. Ooh, great. Well, wow. no, what's interesting is they go, we're concerned mm -hmm. on doing it because we don't want to hurt our brand because yeah. we're doing it, but we're still doing it. Yes. Which, wow, what a duality this organization has to be in because they feel like they need to network and connect, but they're also afraid that someone might get sick from it. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. in that same, you know, so right now I've got, I mean, every, all the ones I had in person have either converted or, or postponed. Right. Till next year. And, and then the ones that I've booked since COVID happened, um, they're all virtual, even into all November, all, yeah. And even November, December, they're all virtual. And, and all of my meeting planner friends that, you know, I've, I, I have a client that is, they book 3000 meetings a year, right? That they're huge. And um, they have told me that you're looking uh, the end of the second quarter of next year for anything greater than 500 people. So like, it's, it's going to be a minute before we get back to the larger conferences. Now there's one happening uh, right now, uh, HR Florida, which is the largest human resource conference in the state of Florida is happening and has been for the last three days. Um, but together? Yeah, it is together but they are socially distanced and it's just weird. You know what I mean? It's a weird thing to be in a room where everybody's six feet apart from each other. 
Um, everybody's wearing masks and, you know, it's just a weird, it, it would think of, think of yourself sort of being in a football stadium and everybody is spread out like this rank and file. It's yeah. just, it's hard to, it's hard to get momentum. It's hard to sort of feel the energy in a room. You know, when we were, when we toured with the band, I would much rather play a 200 person club that slammed together where people are just hot and sweaty and, and it creates a vibe for the room as opposed to, you know, a theater of 1500 that's half empty. No, you're um, out totally. But, but most of these events, is. let's face it, they're business events. They're also for everyone to go have their extracurricular affairs. Yeah. Just true. letting you know, there's it's a true. lot happening at those events. This is very true. <laughs> very true. So let, let, let's go back to this idea of yeah. public speaking mm -hmm. and getting out there and owning the stage. Because I'm looking at like Marcus Bell. Marcus Bell is like you, my child prodigy at music at the age of eight. He was on stage, performance, giant audiences. He owns the stage when it comes to being an artist. Yeah. But being a speaker is a different world, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, unless, unless you have a level of fame that is a household name that can carry onto the stage, right? If you're Bono, everybody knows who Bono is. And so he can transition to the speaker world, even if he wasn't a good speaker, uh, because he's Bono. But there is a different level. The speaker world, you know, and I know, Ken, you, you and I know people who make two, three million dollars a year on the speaking stage, and you would have no idea who they are if, That's you, absolutely weren't, true. if you weren't in that world, right? And so um, what's interesting to me is, so the, the largest competitive sector for fee structure in the speaker world is 10 to 15 grand. So if you're 10 to 15 grand, it is, that's what most conferences, even the smaller conferences still can afford to pay their keynote speaker 10 to 15 grand. When you hit 20 grand, that's a different, you're, now all of a sudden you're at a different level, right? And so you actually are working with a smaller market, but larger events. And so you start to get a little bit higher, you get to 35 and 35 is you're getting into rarefied air, right? And then, and then when you get up above that, when you're at 50 to 75, you know, you're at the Mel Robbins, you're at the, you know, Cat Cole is like 75 to hundred grand now. And you get to Gary V who's 150 or, or, you know, or Simon Sinek's hundred grand, you know, it's like the, there's a different level, but you're not doing, you're not doing three talks a week at a hundred grand. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's one of those deals where I know some of my buddies that are 20 grand speakers, they're still doing 80 gigs a year, um, which is a pretty damn good living. So but I, that's what I'm doing. I'm about 20, 25, but yep. it, it's you're, you're working your ass off because that's you're right. bouncing all over the place. And that's it took right. me a decade to get there. Everyone says, Oh, how do I make it? It takes a decade of losing money. That's true. It's so true. It's it so really true. is. Yeah. Jared, Jared, I'm going to let you go and ask a question. Jared, go ahead, unmute yourself, ask a question to Brent. Hey, sorry, I was uh, muted. Um, how do you get experience if you don't uh, have a household name? And then how do you get better so that you get to the level where you are worth the money that they're paying to see you? Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome question, bud. Um, you know, it, it is a couple of things, I think. Uh, so number one, when you go to speak, you're going to speak anywhere and everywhere that they let you speak. And so if that's the Rotary Club in your local town, then you go speak at the Rotary <laughs> Club at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, if you're going to speak at your, at, you know, your nephew's school and they want a career day and you're going to go in and you're going to speak there as well. <laughs> what, you know, what, it's just like, it's just like the music business. You got to play where the gigs are to get good enough to go play the places you want to play. It's the same thing in the speaker world, right? So the, the thing that I will tell you is, you have to figure out what it is that you're speaking on because that's going to be a huge, a huge place for you to focus, right? So if, you're, if your content is going to be something in the HR world, then you need to go to all of the smaller HR associations that have chapter meetings all over the place and say, I'd love to come and speak to your 30 person chapter in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And, um, and you go and speak for 30 minutes there. And if you do a good job, what you find is that they tell every other chapter in the state about you and you end up doing this little tour um, 
in that industry around one association that has a bunch of chapters. And so um, in the, in the music world, we call that concentric circles, right? So, so you would, you would say, uh, we're going to create this triangle between uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, Atlanta, and Greenville, South Carolina. And we're going to play Orlando for, um, you know, for uh, two weeks. And then we're going to go to Atlanta and play for two weeks. And then we're going to go to Greenville and play for two weeks. And we're going to come back to Orlando and start over. And that's how you start to build a, a fan base that will come knowing that you're going to return there about once every six weeks. And so it's the same sort of a thing with the speaker world. The more that you speak, the more people hear about you, the more they start asking questions and that's what you want. And that's, um, that would be my advice is to, you just, you want to get out and speak wherever that might be. And so you really have to figure out step number one is what are you speaking on and what industries is that going to resonate in? And that's where you start from there. Second would be what you're doing, having a book mm -hmm. really important. Oh yeah. So the like I literally upped my fee $6,000 as soon as I had a book and had no problem getting six grand more because there's just this, there's this perception of authority when you have a book. And it, here's the thing. It doesn't matter what your book is on. It doesn't matter if it's a good book. You just need to have a book in that perception of you <laughs> being an author. It could be a book on ant farts. You were number one on Amazon for ant farts <laughs> in, uh, you know, in this really narrow vertical. And uh, you know, you're, all of a sudden you're a number one Amazon bestseller. And, uh, and that matters to uh, people who are, are booking these events, these meeting planners. They want somebody who has authority. And if you're an author, you must be an authority. Otherwise, why would you have a book? Which is stupid, but it's true. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're doing another thing. Podcasts are really important. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, we started myself and my, uh, one of my business partners is Jim Knight. Jim was the director of learning and development. I want to actually connect him with you, Ken. So he's, he's phenomenal. He was uh, uh, the director of learning and development for Hard Rock for 20 years, wow. 20, 21 years, really responsible for their culture there. Right. And, um, you know, we started this, this podcast called Thoughts That Rock. Uh, just over a year ago. And I think we just, we, we it's a weekly podcast, um, but we just completed like our 65th or 70th show or something like that. But, you know, what we did was we first started the podcast as a way to get gigs. And so when somebody would be thinking about hiring us to be their keynote, we would say, well, we would love to have the CEO of your organization on our podcast. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, Okay. So, you know, the conversation, here's the thing that, that really resonates. And this is a little secret sauce for anyone who really wants to be a speaker. Um, it's so much more than just speaking on stage if you really want to make a living at it. So, so meeting planners are obsessed with just the meeting, but what happens when the meeting ends? Because the person who owns the meeting, that's all they care about. That's all they care about is how are they going to continue because they just spent gobs of money for two or three days. And if it ends at that third day, there's no way they got their, their money's worth out of it. They want it to last a little bit longer. So we would pitch and say, why don't we, uh, we'll have your CEO on our podcast and we'll continue this conversation and we'll release the podcast within 90 days of the conference so that we can drive that conversation and keep it going months after the conversation or after the conference has ended. And they just, well, they fell in love with it, right? Because nobody's thinking about that. They're only thinking about trying to get through to the end of the last day of the conference. And we're going, no, 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 no. You can't, you're never going to get your money's worth unless you can stretch this out three to six months. So what's the plan? And here's the plan from us is we're going to put you on the podcast. We're going to drive this conversation. And that led to more gigs than I can possibly tell you and got us in with a bunch of CEOs for some really big companies that, listen, this is, if you don't know it from this group, I mean, I, my experience with this group was my last call where I'm going, holy shit, look at who's on, look who's on this call. <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, it's Kenny Aronoff and like all of these people are, and I'm going, what is happening right now? It's the same thing in the speaker world. CEOs hang out with other CEOs. 
And so they are friends, their network, they talk. And if you go and kill it for them, guess what? They tell eight of their buddies mm -hmm. that you killed it. And that's where you end up booking three or four more gigs. It's, it hits words of mouth. Uh, Z, you want to ask a question? Z. Yeah. Uh, YouTube. I, I watch a lot of little uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. I follow some guys on YouTube and I've been thinking, is that a good place to start? I, I actually love public speaking and I was corporately trained by General Motors to do it. So I kind of like it. And I'm yeah. Gonna, but YouTube, I don't know how to build a following. Uh, I think maybe that might be the venue right now. Right? So the, the hard truth is, is YouTube is, is passe now. Um, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, um, right now, YouTube has had so much change in how they monetize videos that it really has dissuaded people from using the platform. So they're really living off of what they've been able to accomplish over the last 10 or 15 years. But all of the new things, it's all about live streaming. And, and while you can still do that on YouTube, um, you can also do it on Twitch. You can also do it on Facebook. You can do it on Instagram. You can do it on all these other platforms that to be honest, are, are more powerful platforms right now. Um, even things like TikTok uh, are, is probably the hottest thing on the planet right now. Um, um, if you can start to use these, you know, something like Ecamm in combination with a, another piece of software allows you to multi-stream all at the same time. So you can go live to Facebook, live to YouTube, live to Twitch, live to Instagram, all in the same moment. And so that's probably what I would say is your best bet to build a following is to actually live stream to, to all of these things at once and then see where your traction is. If, if your particular audience lives on YouTube, you're gonna know it based on, based on the numbers and the analytics that come back, right? But if you're, if you're, for me, Facebook is still king. Facebook is still king for, the, for my audience, which is you know, the 40, 40 to, to 55 year old, they're still really comfortable on Facebook. They're not comfortable. Well, those where the event planners are too. That's exactly right. Yeah, event exactly. planners are there in LinkedIn. Hey, I just gotta tell you, something, Brent, that I've been toying with, and I noticed you've been on there, the new Instagram Reels, mm -hmm. which is TikTok, they're the new competitor to TikTok. Yeah. No one's really on it. Correct. So I'm posting stuff on there and I'm getting yeah. 10,000 views That's within awesome. a few hours. No, what I'm saying is any one of us could get on there and That's post it. stuff on there and it will start trending because not enough people are on it yet. That's so right. So it's a good time to dominate it. That's exactly right. That's exactly and right. Have you tried, uh, let me go to it. Have you tried Amazon Live? Do you know much about this? I know, I know that it is a new thing. I have not done it yet, but it is what, from some of these Amazon influencers that I know, they're, they rave yeah, But you it. can become an influencer. Yep. It'll take you about three weeks, but what's yep. nice is you do what you're doing right now, especially yep. to promote your book. Yep. So what's cool is let's just say you do this and you want to promote your book inside there. And then as long as you keep them in there and whatever else they order in their cart, Mm -hmm. while they've got your book from you, you yep. get three to 5% of what's in their cart. Yes. Yes. So, so start telling about the materials you're using to do your, your zoom calls start, you know, right there, yeah. you could start yeah. making serious money yeah. by being an influencer. I'm just saying it's, it's an interesting place. It's it is a desert, but there's it a is. lot of people watching. No question. No question. Reels. I mean, you know, everybody's nervous that TikTok's going to, going to go away. Um, and that's why, Reels is really sort of trying to be that substitute in case uh, the government shuts down TikTok. But there's a um, reason, guys. Come on, remember, remember Trump did that whole thing in Tulsa, and a million tickets were supposed to be sold, mm -hmm. and he was spoofed. That's right. And he was spoofed through TikTok. Yeah. Why do you think he wants to shut it down? I'm That's saying, right. I know. Man, there's know. another story there. <laughs> it's but very here, true. Before we go, yep. first, could we tell Marco how much we love him, even with that haircut? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to worry about a hat, brother. It's okay. <laughs> I'm kidding you, Marco. And before you go, how do we pre uh, pre sell on the book? So, I mean, it's available wherever you, so Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Books a Million, it's available everywhere. We can um, buy it right now? Yep. Yeah. You, you can pre-order right now. It's going to ship on the 29th of this month uh, is, is where it is. So, and this is the deal for me. Your pre-sales are what matter. Your pre-sales are what gets you on the bestseller list. So for me, it would help me tremendously to buy it before the 29th because all of those sales get reported 
in one day. And that one day you get the most amount because it's basically two months, three months worth of sales that all get reported on the one day. And that's your best shot of making these bestseller lists. Once you get past that day, it's, you know, it's, it's 10 times more difficult to hit any of these lists without it becoming a runaway smash. So, you know, we need to get to about four to 5,000 pre-sales to hit the smaller lists, right? The, the Washington journal, uh, Washington post, the wall street journal, um, New York times, you aren't, you aren't hitting that list with less than 15 or 20,000 sales in, in a week. Um, so that's not, that's not one of my goals. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm, I'm trying to shoot for the, for the mid size list. I'm happy to be a wall, you know, a wall street journal bestseller or, or Washington post bestseller. So that's sort of um, where I'm pushing everybody right now is to just get those. There bought. it is. There it is. It. Just bought it. Okay. Fantastic. Got it. Fantastic. Done. Uh, I also bought uh, Black Sheep with um, the movie then too, I guess. You know about the Black Sheep movie, right? Oh, with, yeah, with Chris Farley. Yeah, I got that too. That All was right. I know. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's you crazy. You're hanging out with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Listen, uh, you know, as soon as I get off of this insane roller coaster here in another three weeks, I will be joining because I'm just, uh, I'm absolutely in love with this group and what you guys stand for. And so for me, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal for me to be able to just hang. So thank you so much for, for love the to have you here. Love to have you here. Everyone, yeah. unmute your mic and give it up for Brant for just being part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Everyone have a good yeah, night. Yeah, right on, man. Thank you. Take right. care. You All, All right. right. See you guys. Bye.